What's up, y'all? I'm Lex Story and Ibebu. Thanks for tuning in to Wahala Talk. Today we're here at Wings in Raleigh. They got wings so good, make your heart fly away. Today we have a leader in the community, an organizer, an activist, an entrepreneur, and one of the young political <laughs> savants in America's third reconstruction, Dr. Richard Watkins. How you doing, big brother? I'm doing all right, man. What nice an introduction, you. man. I was like, dang on, that's all me? I, you know, I'm just a regular guy, man. You know, you know, I don't think you're so regular. You know, I've been able to follow you for some time. Uh, you know, we have some mutual connections. Okay. And you're really uh, someone who comes from North Carolina. You were raised in Greensboro. Yep. Uh, yep. You went to school at Fayetteville State University. Yep. Go Broncos. Uh, you also went to school at Carolina. <laughs> yes. Without but, saying. Yep. Carolina and, and Tar now Hills. You, and now you're cutting your teeth out in Durham. Ah, yeah. So, you know, you've been able to pull from all various areas of the state. So what have, what what commonalities have you seen in all of these areas? I just think, you know, overall the people are really, really great. Um, I've been able to work with some amazing talent. I mean, yourself. And I've been able to be interviewed at the same table with the likes of Judge Parker Dunstan. Mm -hmm. uh, we had her on the show. I know, Judge Earl, uh, formal, uh, former mayoral care, um, candidate, uh, Pierce Freeline. Mm -hmm. And so... I'm just amongst amazing company, and all of those individuals are products of North Carolina. Uh, and so it's, it's just a humbling experience to be able to uh, work here and, and do science here. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of my big things is science, and I think one of the cool things about North Carolina that a lot of people uh, overlook is mm -hmm. its role in science. In fact, you know, you can't spell science without NC, and hey. it's really cool to be part of an environment that has North Carolina Central. <laughs> Uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, mm -hmm. Duke, NC State. Um, we have so many amazing schools doing uh, such amazing work. It's just really exciting to be in this area. So it's all about those tobacco roads. <laughs> so, you know, you talk about all of the amazing schools here in North Carolina. Yeah. You went to Fayetteville State. Yeah. Before you became a, a scientist, you were studying psychology. Right. Um, how did you that shift go from going into doing immunology and microbiology from psychology to that? Yeah. You know, I made several shifts. Uh, when I was in high school, yeah. I was really interested in graphic design. Yeah. Uh, in Greensboro, I went to Grimsley High School. Yeah. Um, and I also took classes at, I think, what's now known as Weaver Academy. Okay. And uh, I did graphic design there. It was a lot of fun. Uh, really, really cool work with, at the time, cutting-edge technology to make yeah. amazing graphics. Um, and when I went to Fayetteville State, I actually switched up again and did business. Mm -hmm. uh, I did business marketing. And I was doing that for a while until I took my Psych 101 class. And if you talk to a lot of people who do things they love, they oftentimes have an experience in which they interact with an amazing educator. Yeah. Um, and in my situation, it was a psychology professor uh, named Dr. Hasty. Yeah. I really, really loved his class. And after taking his class, I was like, all right, forget business. I'm switching to psychology. Mm. I did psychology and sociology. Um, and still today, you know, I'll, I'm always fascinated with how, you know, people think, how people behave, how people work together um, in a form of a society. Um, and still to this day, it's really, really amazing. I made the switch uh, to doing research uh, in infectious diseases, immunology and microbiology, uh, because of the continued HIV crisis. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to do research because I remember getting tested for HIV during huge campaigns for everybody to know their yeah. status. And, and what led you to that? Like, you know, that's it's in, in the African American community, it's, it's still, even though it's 2018, yeah. about to be 2019, it's still somewhat taboo. Well, you know, I played football at Fayetteville State University, and I can tell you for a fact that there was a huge initiative uh, at Fayetteville State University uh, to get tested. Mm. Um, Why so, was that? Uh, well, I mean, I think it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I can only say that there were, I guess, amazing leaders, student leaders at Fayetteville State University mm -hmm. in influential positions uh, who knew it was important um, and did something about it. And so in the wake of that, I remember getting tested, you know, doing um, the responsible thing, mm -hmm. um, knowing your status. For anybody who's sexually active, uh, know your status. 
Um, so I did that. And I just remember, you know, kind of how stressful it is. Mm. You think about all the bad decisions you may have made just being young. Mm. Um, and you don't want to actually have to, you know, pay for those. Yeah. Uh, but when you are waiting on those results, mm. you know, you start going through all of the stages of acceptance. Uh, one of those denial, you know, anger, mm. sorrow. But one of those is bargaining. Mm. Uh, and anybody has told themselves this when... Uh, you know, they don't study for a test, so they wait till the last minute to mm. do an assignment. They say, you know, if I can just get through this, I just promise I'll it. never <laughs> do it again. Um, and so it was a little bit like that. And so I said, you know, if I'm HIV positive, I'm going to be waiting yeah. for somebody to create that breakthrough, mm. right? I'm going to be waiting for somebody else to save my life. And so I said to myself, you know, if I, if I'm just, if I can just get seen through this and, and be HIV negative, um, I, I, I don't know how I'm going to do it. Uh, but I'm going to conduct research in HIV. Mm. At that time, I went to Fayetteville State, what, psychology, and what, I had no idea. What, what position did you play on the football team? I played wide receiver. Oh, really? Yeah. So, like yourself, you know, I still run to this day. I grew up playing, doing, being an athlete, running track, playing soccer. Yeah. And it wasn't until I became in my mid-20s that I saw different lessons I gained from playing sports and being an athlete. Uh, what lessons did you gain from playing football? I, so, I think... In football, I think the team is really important. Mm -hmm. You can't do it alone. You have to have a, a, a talented team around you to succeed. Um, in my first year at Fayetteville State, we won the CIAA championship. Mm -hmm. uh, Fayetteville State uh, played in the CIAA championship this year. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, uh, we lost this year. But, you know, that's all right. Go Broncos. We'll be back because mm -hmm. we're always talented. We always have good coaches. Oh, yeah. uh, and, you know, I play with some amazing talent. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I wasn't even that good. I was just mm. fortunate to be on the team. Yeah. Uh, but those those guys were absolutely great. Many of them are friends to today. And uh, the thing that I learned from from playing football is, you know, you can't do it alone. You have to have a team, and you've got to trust your teammates to do their job. You, yeah. as a wide receiver, I can't throw the ball to myself. Mm -mm. I can't block for the quarterback. Mm -hmm. All I can focus on is running my route, getting open, and when the ball's thrown to me, um, catch it. And I think working as a team and everybody doing their little part uh, to achieve a common goal, mm -hmm. regardless of who you are, is the, the key lesson that I learned from football. Mm. I love it. I believe that 100%. So, all again, we know mutual people, so although you're not an attorney, you're an <laughs> attorney of Jace, because, you know, the first time I met you was at yeah. an attorney's event. Right, right, so right. So, would you, you know coax your sister's ego and would you say that you know you became a public servant because of your sister being an attorney i i can definitely say that that has been one of the most amazing things you know as an older brother yeah uh i think one of the things that i can say that i'm proudest of is my sister's name mm -hmm. preceding me mm -hmm. You know, I go to places and I'm introduced to other people. Oh, that's Candace's brother. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's how you know uh, that you come from good stock, mm -hmm. uh, that your mom and your dad did a really, really good job. When your younger sister mm -hmm. uh, you look up to. Mm -hmm. uh, and so shout out Candace. Candace is an amazing, amazing individual, uh, amazing talent of North Carolina. North Carolina is better, better for having her. Uh, and, and not only uh, Candace, but my, my wife, Charity, mm -hmm. uh, who's a social worker, uh, mm -hmm. assistant professor at North Carolina Central. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm surrounded by people I can look up to. Um, she's an amazing talent, one of the most brilliant people that I've ever come across. I had to marry her. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I always say, well, in my case, marry up. And she was uh, <laughs> extremely talented, uh, and I'm happy that she had me. Uh, but I'm just surrounded by amazing people who always push me uh, to do great things. Yeah. And uh, I think North Carolina is full of that. And um, I've been very, very blessed and fortunate uh, to just have like really talented and really kind people yeah. uh, to have in my company and to say, hey, I know that person. And it's yeah. really amazing. Of course. You know, we need to be anchored. And a lot of times <laughs> the women in our life will do that. Right. So, back to Fayetteville State. So yes, yes. HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, are in right. a peculiar place, not just in North Carolina, but within the country at this present moment. Right. Um, you know, recently, I think it was maybe 2016, 2017, that the North Carolina legislature kind of tried to defund HBCUs in the state. Yeah. Um, so, what place do you think that, H do, that HBCUs have 
in this country and what is their importance within this country? Yeah, HBCUs are really important. They have a culture in and of itself. And anybody who studies sociology knows the importance mm -hmm. of that. There is a certain experience of waking up and interacting with individuals who look like you, and a very weird things happen. Mm -hmm. When you go and operate in an HBCU, you no longer represent the black community. Mm -hmm. You just represent yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the few times in an individual's lifetime where they can have that experience. And I'm speaking from personal experience. Yeah. Um, and so that kind of invisible knapsack they talk about in sociology as a, a black male, you're able to experience that at least for four years mm -hmm. at an HBCU. Mm. And that was absolutely crucial to my development. I wouldn't be where I'm at today yeah. um, if it wasn't for Fayetteville State University. Mm -hmm. and, and moreover, I can at least speak towards the sciences. Mm -hmm. Out of the universities um, throughout our nation mm -hmm. that produce um, blacks who go on and receive their PhDs mm -hmm. um, in science, the vast majority of the top ten mm -hmm. are HBCUs. And why do you think that is when a, a lot of um, a lot of African American and Black students want to go to the top tier PWI institutions? You know, and I think that that point makes my point even more so. Uh, talking about the importance of the HBCU, because mm -hmm. not only that, more Blacks go to HWIs, historically white institutions, mm -hmm. than goes to HBCUs. Mm -hmm. So the efficiency at which HB, HBCUs produce PhD recipients in science, technology, engineering, and math mm. is greater mm. than that at a historically white institution. And I think oftentimes when we try to achieve greatness or we try to achieve success, one of the things we overlook are several aspects of sociology that states you need a support structure. Mm -hmm. You talked to me a little bit about why, what lessons did you learn playing football? A team. Mm. A team. Being an individual focusing on what you're supposed to do yeah. and having support of other people doing their job mm -hmm. is something that you get in the HBCU. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot harder at an HWI, even though you have more resources, yeah. because you're carrying with you a burden. Mm -hmm. Right? Not to say that you're not supposed to carry that burden. Mm -hmm. uh, I, My sister went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill to receive my PhD. I mean, so did my wife. Um, not to say that amazing talent isn't produced all over the place, mm -hmm. but we can't overlook the importance of having a support system. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that happens different yeah. at an HBCU because you come out with a network, that, that networking that's in place through yeah. HBCUs, having role models mm -hmm. in positions of power mm -hmm. who look just like you. Mm, so we, reaffirming. Yeah, we know that's important, mm -hmm. right? And so because we know that's important, um, it doesn't take much to understand why HBCUs are important mm -hmm. because we know it's important for people's overall development. Mm -hmm. I understand completely. So what would you say that would be the specific needs that differentiate HBCUs from predominantly white institutions which these HBCUs need so as not to die off in this current climate. So what do HBCUs need? Yes, that is different from what PWIs need. Well, I think all institutions need support. Of course. And HBCUs can't be looked at as, okay, that's not important. I shouldn't go to an HBCU. Yeah. They need people to look at HBCUs as institutions where you can receive magnificent education. Mm -hmm. um, you and I both know amazing individuals that went to any number of HBCUs around the country. Mm -hmm. um, we need to continue to say that. Well, I shouldn't say around the country because mm -hmm. HBCUs are predominantly in the South. Mm -hmm. um, let's not forget that. Yeah. Um, and I think there's more HBCUs in North Carolina than anywhere else. Um, Somebody fact check me on that. Um, if you look that up and find something different, put that down in the comment section. But Let I do believe know. that there's more HBCs in North Carolina than anywhere else. And like I said, if you find different, please educate me. Um, but yeah, I think they definitely need support. Mm -hmm. They need people always talking about the HBCU experience. Um, everybody knows what it's like to go to the CIAA tournament when mm -hmm. it's happened, how amazing that is, or what it's like to go uh, to any homecoming at the HBCU uh, or the greatest homecoming on earth, uh, North Carolina A&T's homecoming. 
Uh, so everybody knows what that's like. Um, and yeah. so we can't, we can't overlook the importance of the HBCU, um, mm -hmm. and I think that always needs to be supported, and mm -hmm. we need to have students go to HBCUs. Uh, tuition is a big deal. Uh, federal support for HBCUs is, is critical, so people who are teaching or trying to do projects, mm -hmm. uh, they need to be funded, um, so on and so forth. And I also have to give a shout-out for amazing scientific conferences that support HBCUs mm -hmm. and um, minorities at historically white institutions, such as the annual biomedical Co um, research conference for minority students, mm -hmm. is absolutely amazing. It's a place where individuals are able to showcase their talent and their research um, and communicate it to a wide audience. I mm -hmm. think things like that are really important for the sustainability of HBCUs and overall the sustainability of innovation in our country mm -hmm. um, as a whole. I agree. So going back to science, you founded the Science Policy Action Network in yes. 2015. Right. Um, what have been some highlights during that tenure of founding that organization, and what do you think the importance of having a black scientist as the founder of that organization, and in general, that, of that has been? Oh, I just think, so uh, I think one of the highlights is being able to produce, uh, work with the North Carolina Science Festival. Yeah. Uh, they had a, a STEM event uh, in which I was able to give a presentation mm. at the uh, Moorhead Planetarium. Yeah. And uh, it was filled with kids. And uh, I was worried about being able to keep children's attention, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, when you give a PowerPoint presentation on a dome, mm -hmm. uh, that does a trick. That's and pretty so epic. That was a really, really <laughs> cool experience. Uh, working with the Raleigh March for Science yeah. as their official fiscal sponsor mm -hmm. uh, was amazing to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, uh, we worked with the uh, Value of the Vote Summit. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked with uh, Pierce Freeline. Um, and, and Mary White, who was uh, the MC at the event mm -hmm. and the Science Policy Action Network, ran a workshop mm -hmm. uh, on democracy in the age of technology mm -hmm. in which we talked a little bit how democracy and how individuals interface with democracy um, is, is changed forever mm -hmm. uh, due to technology. Um, mm -hmm. And those have just been some of the key... Uh, Highlights. We've done other things, but those have been some really, really cool things that we've been able to do. Uh, and we look forward to doing really amazing things in the future mm -hmm. uh, because whether you like it or not, uh, we live in a science world. Yeah. Uh, cures for cancers are going to come from science. Technological mm -hmm. advances are going to come from science. Um, our way out of climate change is yeah. going to be through science. 100%. Um, so... Whether you're actively conducting research, mm -hmm. uh, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a business person, um, in some way, shape, fashion, or form, you're enjoying uh, the breakthroughs of science. I mean, I'm yeah. pretty sure this microphone right here didn't always exist, mm -hmm. uh, but we, we all enjoy that, um, and so we're all part of the kind of the overall scientific enterprise. I agree. Um, and as, as a black man in science... Mm -hmm. um, I think, again, it's really important to have representation. Mm. Uh, diversity is, is critical. Mm -hmm. And you can't have science without diversity. Mm. You can't have excellence without diversity. And the reason I say that is because we have no idea mm. what mind holds the next scientific breakthrough. Mm. We have no idea who has the next idea that's going to cure cancer mm -hmm. or, or find a cure uh, for HIV or stop the uh, progression of HIV uh, towards AIDS mm -hmm. uh, or who's going to create that new hot new technology that everybody loves who's going to create the, the next phone or the next app mm -hmm. uh, we don't know who's going to do it mm -hmm. um, so the only way that we can actually harness uh, the, the collective brain power of everyone is to allow everyone access to yeah. science um, and so our best way to do it is to get everybody conducting research. Mm -hmm. And if we can't get everybody conducting research or involved in science, we have to give as many people the opportunity as possible. Yeah. And that's our only way we're going to find, out, find our way out of some of the problems and difficulties that we currently find ourselves in. Um, so, yeah, that's, you can't have science without diversity. They're, they're interlinked. You never know what mind is <clears throat> looking over. Yeah. So circling back to... Uh, you know, now that we're back on the science talk, yeah. back on HIV and, and AIDS in the black community, yeah. you know, it seems that because of capitalism, 
that certain uh, medications or cures may not be let out at certain points. And, you know, as of recent, there's been talks of certain litigation in regards to certain infections and non-infectious diseases and the cures, which may have been, may have been, been installed. Mm -hmm. um, so why do you think that is, and what are your feelings on that? Well, I know there's incredible research being done. Mm -hmm. As of right now, there is no cure for HIV. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, an amazing virus uh, that has been with, you know, humans and non-human primates for a long time. Mm -hmm. And HIV, like any virus, evolves to infect us and to create more of itself. Mm -hmm. So no matter what therapy or what treatment that we do have in place, that virus will evolve or another virus will come along. Mm -hmm. Throughout all life, not just human life, there has been this kind of arms race between yeah. life and, and viruses. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's always going to be the case. Yeah. Um, if we find a cure for HIV, we're going to have to find a cure for another virus. Viruses are always going to be evolving. Yeah. That's the name of the game. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Regarding capitalism um, and regarding how, how it's affected us, from a capitalistic point of view, it's not necessarily uh, the person in the capitalist society to refrain itself from greed, right? Yeah. I think an individual's job is to produce quality products and mm -hmm. produ quality services yeah. and sell it for a profit, mm -hmm. right? Now, it's government's job yeah. to provide resources, to support people and economic growth, but also to provide regulations yeah. to protect the general public from just uncontrollable greed. Yeah. And that's how it's set up. But the problem is there is so much influence from the kind of the capitalistic sector that is only focused on uh, greed on government. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like, what's the saying? It's the fox watching the hen house. Mm -hmm. So government's not able to actually do its duty of providing resources to the public for economic growth and regulations mm. to uh, companies yeah. to, to kind of constrain that. And when you have kind of greed unchecked, mm. ultimately everybody loses because wealth is accumulated in uh, the hands of a small few. Mm -hmm. And that may seem good for a while, mm. but overall society will begin to deteriorate. Mm -hmm. And even that small few who has all those resources, they still need the larger, the greater number of people yeah. for them to support themselves. I agree. And so I think overall, um, with society and, and life in general, mm -hmm. uh, you have these bottlenecks, yeah. right? And I think with such a concentration of wealth in the hands of so few, we're, we're reaching a bottleneck. Mm. Um, and things will change. Things are already changing. Yeah. Um, and Things will be upset. I mean, we have an opportunity now to do something about it. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, since, I believe, like 1960, um, the gap between that small number of people and everybody else, people like you and me, yeah. um, is greater than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about, like, rich like you're thinking. I'm talking about, like, rich like 72 dollars uh i did the math like for jeff bezos and somebody check me on this too because i know i'm probably wrong i can't remember the numbers mm -hmm. uh but it's like 72 dollars a minute yeah uh every hour 24 hours a day seven days a week even mm -hmm. while you're sleeping uh that's the kind of wealth that i don't think most people can comprehend mm -hmm. and in a capitalistic society um that type of wealth means unprecedented power and influence oh, yeah. Um, and that's what we're seeing both in um, every form of our society, whether it's trying to get uh, drugs to market, whether it's health care, whether it's climate change, yeah. whether it's government. Uh, the power of the dollar is ultimate. And when you concentrate so much of it mm -hmm. in the hands of so few, mm -hmm. they have a lot of power. And I think there's a saying that says absolute power corrupts Corrupt. absolutely. absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what we see. And I... I that's just what we see. Yeah, that's, that always happens. <clears throat> so it always needs to be some constraint or some restraint from other outside sources all within the system. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like with cancer, you know, that affects African-American women, 
it's you know both of our families have been affected by cancer. Yeah. Again, your con my condolences to your mother. Thank you. My grandmother also passed from breast cancer, and my mother's yeah. a breast cancer survivor. Oh, well, so great. I know it all too well. Um, you know, any woman that's descended from West Africa uh, likely suffers from triple negative. Uh, cancer, if I'm saying it correctly. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. so it's a more aggressive, a more aggressive type of cancer um, than uh, their other counterparts. Um, so, in the progression from HIV to AIDS, do you see something similar with how that operates for Black peoples or peoples of West African descent? So, I, I'm not that familiar with that area, but I will tell you that our there are differences mm -hmm. between individuals regarding the progression to AIDS. Mm -hmm. uh, and what all that what that means is that your C D four T cell count has dropped down to a level that now your immune system is not necessarily capable of preventing infections yeah. that an otherwise healthy immune system uh, would be able to protect itself against. And there are differences between individuals and since there are so many mutations, there are different um, types of HIV mm -hmm. that affect different people. And those HIVs uh, tend to progress at different rates. Mm -hmm. So it, it's very complicated, and um, I'm not completely uh, aware of all the literature that exists mm -hmm. that says particularly people descended from West Africa uh, progress towards AIDS faster than anyone else, but that information may very well exist. I understand. So, you know, during the Clinton administration, we had a, you know, proliferation of, uh, of drugs for people who had HIV, whereas Reagan wouldn't even say the word HIV AIDS for, like, basically the whole tenure of his presidency. <coughs> we had a proliferation of these drugs, and consequently, you know, the death and the spread of it went down. But at this present moment, um, in the new millennium in 2018, I think, like, I don't know the specific statistic, but it's basically, like, one in two black gay men uh, will attain the disease within their lifetime. So, where that, whereas that's not necessarily uh, the same for their white counterparts, and what do you attribute that vast difference to? I think social economic factors play a large role mm -hmm. in that. Also, we do know that if you maintain the regimen of therapy or therapeutic uh, antiretroviral therapies, um, the likelihood that you will transmit the virus to your partner mm -hmm. is greatly reduced. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to do a lot of research. I know a lot of this research is being done at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and other places. Mm -hmm. um, however, there's a, there's a lot of things that may account for that. You could have adherence to drug regimens. Uh, you have other social economic factors that may play a role in that. Mm -hmm. um, also, knowing your status. Mm -hmm. uh, so, there's, like I said, there's a lot, there's a great deal of that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also information, um, and there's been a couple of papers that, now this is going to seem unrelated, <clears throat> but there's a lot of paper that have linked mm -hmm. specifically the war on drugs specifically mm. with the increased prevalence of HIV in the black community. Wow. Um, I, I think that paper came out of Stanford University several years ago. Mm. Um, and so there are a lot of social economic factors that play a role mm. in these type of things. Mm. And they've always had. Yeah, um, that's, that's with everything. Yeah, and mm. uh, I think ultimately, I think the... In, and this is anecdotal, but I would love people to deal with this. I think there is a a great deal of homophobia present in some areas of the black community mm -hmm. that may also play a role in the inability of individuals who may be at risk for HIV infection mm -hmm. to seek the proper support yeah. uh, that they should be seeking. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think I think that may have a role in it, but it's really difficult at this time to say specifically uh, what is responsible for it. But I will say this, and I said it earlier, yeah. I think one of the things that's really, really important, um, if you are sexually active and you do uh, engage in risky behavior, um, 
the best thing for any individual to do is to know their status. Yeah. Uh, get tested, know your status. Um, that's really, really important. I agree. So as vice chairman um, in the health committee for the uh, Durham Affairs, of the, the Durham Committee on Black Affairs, um, are y'all dealing with the, you know, in the past three years, the HIV rate has risen in North Carolina and also in the past, like, year or so, the sickles rate has risen in Durham and the Triangle specifically. Um, are y'all dealing with that, and what do you attribute those recent rises to? So, um, yeah, and it, first of all, the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People uh, is a historic organization mm -hmm. that I have had the honor of being involved with um, as vice chair and uh, briefly as interim chair. Yeah. Um, and that's been an amazing subcommittee of the overall Durham committee to be a part of is the health committee. Yeah. Uh, the things that are, are really important is that the information um, gets out uh, to individuals regarding this. Yeah. Um, there are several individuals that work for different health organizations in Durham that do an amazing job um, of trying to keep track of that. If there is a rise in... Um, different sexually transmitted diseases, um, then there has to be um, increased uh, events for transmission occurring. Um, if there's a rise in HIV, then that means individuals aren't knowing their status. Mm. If there's a rise in HIV, that also means people aren't necessarily taking advantage of all the resources that are available, or there may not even be a presence of those resources. Mm. Um, society is very complicated. And every single infection um, is affected by all of these nuances of society. Mm. Um, so if there's a rise in syphilis, and I didn't know that, mm. um, even though we did a, a report. Uh, so each committee meeting, we put together a report. And early on, we were putting together reports on different things such as uh, cancer, um, and HIV, and we do know in general in the South, uh, HIV prevalence is extremely high. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I really don't know that, but it needs to be definitely addressed. Mm -hmm. um, and it has it, to be. And if people are aware and people are knowledgeable, they can make informed decisions. Uh, and those informed decisions will ultimately um, reduce the prevalence of these infections. Mm -hmm. um, but there's other infections uh, that are, are a really big problem, um, such as um, flu. Um, yeah. People need to be vaccinated mm -hmm. um, against the flu uh, regularly um, and everyone um, because the more people uh, that are vaccinated, uh, the less likely that a single individual is going to um, actually be infected with influenza and develop flu symptoms and develop the flu. Mm -hmm. um, so all of these things are really important, and we need to be able to talk about this in the public's um, sphere. Yeah. And you're actually now inspiring me uh, to, to go back to the, my nonprofit yeah. and conduct the necessary research mm -hmm. and, and see what information is available yeah. regarding the rise of syphilis and the rise of HIV in Durham and see if we can figure out a little bit uh, more to that. So um, for anybody watching, um, I did not necessarily know there was a rise in syphilis um, in Durham. Um, but I think we do have the capacity within the Science Policy Action Network uh, to do something uh, about that. One thing that the Science Policy Action Network was able to do yeah. is uh, we partnered up with uh, Adam and Eve. Yeah. Uh, and we distributed condoms yeah. to barbershops in Durham and Chapel Hill. Mm. We worked with... Uh, the Durham Health Department mm -hmm. uh, to, to put uh, condoms in um, barbershops in Durham yeah. and put condoms in barbershops in Chapel Hill yeah. to make it really easy for people to get uh, the necessary protection yeah, uh, so they can reduce the risk. Uh, in a comfortable environment when mm -hmm. you're getting your hair cut mm -hmm. uh, no so you judgment. don't have to go to the store. Yeah. yeah, people just have them in the bathrooms. And I think efforts like that uh, can really do some, some really good at lowering uh, the rates of uh, HIV transmission and other sexually transmitted diseases. 100%. So you definitely have to keep that going. So let's pivot for a moment. Uh, you are uh, among the young black and brown professionals in this recent election who ran, who weren't necessarily part of the establishment. And you are part of a historic time, which many are considering somewhat of a 
period of, of reconstruction, uh, altering of the system. Um, so, what do you, changes do you think this surge will bring? Yeah, so, what I see is this, right? Is I think there are two major parties, yeah. right? Democrats and Republicans. Mm -hmm. However, social ideologies are varied, right? Yeah. You have progressives, mm -hmm. you have liberals, you have conservatives, and you have regressivists, mm -hmm. uh, people who don't like change, who want to go back to an older thing, yeah. right? But you only have two parties. So you have maybe one or two options to have uh, an appropriate political system. Either you have more than two actual competitive parties, yeah. or those two parties have to support and encourage primaries yeah. so different voices are represented mm -hmm. within those establishments. Mm -hmm. Without those things happening, it's going to be really hard to have a, true, a, a functioning democracy in which people feel represented. And mm -hmm. what has happened, as you saw, actually in both the Republican side and both the Democratic side, you have people running primaries. Yeah. Um, and one of the other things that you saw happening was the blue wave that people discussed happening, which they hoped would happen in the Senate and in the House, but only happened in the House, mm -hmm. was more of a kind of a movement of the Democratic Party towards the inclusion of people who have historically not have had an opportunity to have a voice. Mm -hmm. You had several firsts uh, making it to the House of Representatives. Unfortunately, uh, due to gerrymandering yeah. at the congressional uh, level, the federal level, mm -hmm. um, North Carolina wasn't able to participate yeah. in that blue wave of the House. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's, there's probably over 50% uh, of the voters are Democrat, but we mm -hmm. only have three representatives uh, the United States um, House of Representatives who are Democrat yeah. and so unfortunately we weren't able to participate yeah. um, in that blue wave uh, but we had a lot of exciting moments um, yeah. you know I was able to run against uh, establishment David Price mm -hmm. um, met some really amazing people yeah. um, I'm just disappointed that I let those people down by losing you didn't uh, let them down at all we were running some, for some really important things mm -hmm. And time is of the essence. It is. And, you know, if we would have won, we would have been able to make immediate action on those things. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you know, I didn't win. And, you know, and I, I, I really appreciate the support of everyone else. Um, I just didn't do a good enough job reaching out to people and talking to people mm -hmm. um, as I had to do to beat a person as established mm -hmm. as David Price. So if you were to run again, what would you do differently? So I will run again. Okay, talk about it. Yeah, and I think uh, bringing in more talent. So I had some of the most amazing talent uh, in North Carolina, and whatever I was able to do was because of those talented individuals on my team, mm -hmm. uh, yourself, uh, Jacob Ribbit, uh, Samantha, Johnny, um, people on the graphics team. I mean, we had some amazing talent, mm -hmm. um, and I think – I need to provide more resources mm -hmm. to those individuals so that they can be more effective, you know, as a leader, as a candidate, mm -hmm. um, being able to have such talented people around me, I have to provide them with better resources so that they're able to do their jobs more effectively. Mm -hmm. And that's what I will do. Mm -hmm. um, because like I said, there were a lot of people who had never heard of me before. I, I can't imagine somebody uh, who's never heard of me before those people who voted for me, so politics is all about relationships. 100%. Right. You had uh, David Price, who is a hero amongst the Democratic Party. He's been in that area uh, representing for 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, you had Michelle Laws, who a lot of people love and know uh, for a long time. They've been able to build relationships and rapport with people. Um, and me, mm -hmm. somebody who hasn't been in that public space, mm -hmm. which means the people who voted for me didn't vote for me based on them knowing me. So why do you think they voted for you then? They voted for me based on the ideas, mm -hmm. based on the world they would like to live in. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have to do better for them 
because I do believe that's the world we need to live in, the world where education is something that everybody has, not just the rich, that healthcare is something that everyone has, not just the rich, and that climate change is viewed as a priority uh, because we don't have much time. Um, and when I'm saying that much time, I'm literally talking about uh, collapse of civilization, um, slow motion towards another bottleneck. And when I say bottleneck, I'm talking about large populations uh, dying, yeah. very large populations dying. Um, we can't live without our earth. We're not, not separate all. from it. We breathe air, mm -hmm. we drink water, mm -hmm. we'll die if it's not clean. Yes. Um, and keep in mind, I'm not just throwing that out there. I have a two-year-old daughter. Okay. And so when I say people dying because we don't address climate change, mm -hmm. I'm talking about my own flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about me. Um, and so that's why I apologize, even though there are people proud of me for running. That's why I apologize for not winning. Because when I don't win, those priorities aren't a priority for the person I was running against. Um, even though there are amazing people out there doing good work, I've got to get back out there. I've got to join the fight again so that we can do something about it. Um, and shout out to uh, those people who, who won that do represent uh, what I think. Uh, I think the biggest person out there is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez um, mm -hmm. out of New York. I mean, you see the things that she's doing, mm -hmm. encouraging people to run primaries, making yeah. climate change a priority. Um, and I was really proud uh, to be a member of Brand New Congress yeah. along with her. Um, so also shout out to Brand New Congress Most definitely. who supported me when a lot of local um, organizations would not support me. Mm -hmm. um, so I really thank uh, Brand New Congress for that. Well, it's okay. <clears throat> you don't need to be down on yourself. Yeah. You know, we fall down seven, we get up eight. Oh, yeah. That's okay, you know, for for those who are anointed, who have the vision, it's not going to always be the easiest. Yes. So you must know that. Um, so, you know, you're running in a in a district that's, that's changing at a rapid pace right now. Yes, it is. There is so much development. Mm -hmm. There is so much migration. And quite frankly, there is also an exodus of people's here. Okay. So a, a leader in this district, which is District 4, which is very vast, <laughs> encompassing not only Chapel Hill, but also Durham <laughs> County, and also Wake, and, we're, and the part of Wake that we're talking about is the part of Wake County that's changing the most, which is downtown and Southeast Raleigh. Yes. <laughs> so what do you possess as a leader which differentiates you from others and what is needed for a leader in this type of district, in this type of area? When you talk about change, mm -hmm. you're talking about people moving to an area, mm -hmm. changing the, the demographic and the way that area thinks mm -hmm. and the way that that area operates. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would bring to this particular leadership position mm -hmm. is just that. Yeah. It represents not only the change in age demographic of that area, yeah. it also represents the change of educational um, achievement in that area yeah. but keep in mind and I will not uh, every last one of our candidates myself Michelle Laws and David yeah. Price were all PhD recipients mm. there are not too many places whose primary is like that yeah. so shout out to the fourth congressional district for producing some of the mm. smartest representatives that you can find um, but yeah that role uh, of science and, and, that, and that role of in that, in that role of education and, and climate change is really important. I mean, mm -hmm. the March for Science was um, in Raleigh, um, yeah. and I was involved with both marches for science. Um, and I think that's, that's really, really important. And also, let's talk about this. Um, we need energy into politics in general yeah. to get more people to vote. Uh, also, shout out to the midterms. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the most participated in midterms in an off-year election mm -hmm. uh, in the history of uh, America. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are getting involved, and you need that type of energy. You, you, need, need, you need that type of energy. Um, you know, I love to give speeches. Uh, I love to get the crowd riled up, mm -hmm. and uh, you need that kind of energy to get people excited uh, about politics. And, yes. you know, I definitely bring that to the table. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
I, I think that's a really, really cool thing. So you spoke about, you alluded to somewhat the problematicness of the two-party system. So if you see that problematic nature, why run under the democratic veil when you see that it has, to a certain extent, been uh, somewhat in contradiction and contravention to progressive candidates and the black, black candidates in the black community? Yeah, because the other part of that was running a primary. Mm -hmm. I think that's the only way mm -hmm. that the two-party system can function is running primaries. Mm -hmm. Concepts of liberalism and concepts of progressivism only mean anything yeah. in a primary. Mm -hmm. When you get to the general, it's just my team versus your team. Mm -hmm. We don't care about, oh, progressivism or liberalism mm -hmm. or democratic socialist we or conservative yeah. or far right nobody cares about that it's just mm -hmm. my team versus your team mm -hmm. and so all of those small subtleties yeah. of ideology go out the window yeah. and so that's why you absolutely have to have a prim primary so different voices are yeah. represented different ideas are shared mm -hmm. um, and so that's definitely why I ran yeah. um, as, as a democrat um and I thought it was an amazing experience being able to have platforms and challenge the status quo on such a large of scale and such a, a large platform. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought ideas were able to be shared um, that hadn't before in that particular area. Most definitely. Uh, but yeah, you, you're, you're absolutely right. Because um, you're kind of getting at this kind of concept of, all right, we need, we all know we need more parties, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, or we all know we need something that is like not Democrat and not, not Republican. Mm -hmm. So what's stopping everybody from doing it? Mm -hmm. I think what's stopping everybody from doing it is just the sheer power mm -hmm. of those two institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, you want your voice to be heard, uh, but if you're not part of those things, you don't have a microphone, right? Yeah. Uh, so how are we going to get around that? Mm. Well, you're going to definitely have to have a charismatic, aspiring leader kind of break that mold mm -hmm. and, and just do it. And not only do it, be successful at it. Yeah. Uh, when they do that, mm -hmm. uh, then it works. I mean, this model of running primaries against establishment people, I mean, yeah. that's a new thing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was just that kind of person. Mm -hmm. Uh, they were inspiring. She was charismatic, mm -hmm. and she won. Mm -hmm. And now she's the biggest name of the entire Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. I don't care what anybody says. She's my representative. Mm. Uh, well, that's what happens at the federal level. One vote affects the entire nation. It's a ripple effect. Yeah, it's a, it's a ripple effect. Um, and so, you know, that's a step in, in, in a major, major direction. Um, mm -hmm. And it provides a lot of people with hope. Uh, but also, you know, kind of this conversation about do we need another party? Yeah. Um, I definitely see. I definitely think we're going to have that. Yeah. Um, I think the party actually to see that happen to first uh, is actually the the, the Republican Party I probably uh, because you have uh, the kind of Trump supporters and then you have the establishment Republicans and you're seeing uh, a huge break in that. And I've heard uh, several kind of Republican kind of talking heads kind of allude to this kind of Trump party kind yeah. of thing, which kind of starts to say, like, they're not, like, true Republicans, they're not yeah. establishment Republicans. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you, I'm, I believe you're probably going to see two parties emerge mm -hmm. in which you have the really far regressives, yeah. right? And then you have the kind of establishment conservatives mm -hmm. finding their, their, their own homes. And mm -hmm. I think that's what you're going to have with that. Now, the Republican Party is going to probably do everything in its power to keep, keep all of all that together. under one house. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's so hard to keep that all together when there's so many fundamental differences mm, between people. At this point. Right? So I think that's what you're going to have. That's what you're going to see happening. Um, but ultimately, I don't think people should uh, hate that that happens. Yeah. I think... Uh, it's progression. You got to have it. Because this, this, this system is broken. Yeah. So. So do you think that the African-American community should create its own party or shift between parties depending on the candidates and move their support as a block um, depending on the election? Yeah, well, 
from my experience, and I'd love to hear your take on it. Yeah. I don't think the African American community or the black community is monolithic by any means. Not at all. I think there's huge differences mm-hmm. um, in the way. What our treatment is. Yeah. In the way people. What do you mean by that in our treatment? So we, we're very different. You know, you can have someone like it's like tribes. It's like you can have someone that's Creole. Oh, you can somebody, yes. You can have someone that's. That's first generation American. They're right. still black. You can have someone that's Latino. They might be Cuban, but they're still black. Oh, Although got it. we're all very different, our treatment within this country, okay. and the things that we go through, yeah, as black Americans, right, is the same. Yeah. So I mean, I think that's that's really really interesting because you you have you, you create a situation in which black people are of two separate minds, right? Yeah. One, you have like personal ideologies and beliefs yeah. but then you also have this other thing which knows that regardless of what you may think and how you may think different from other black people mm-hmm. uh, the, the consequences of institutionalized racism affect everybody Yeah, uh, and so that's very true I mean I heard um, Michael Eric Dyson say that if the Republican Party uh wasn't so openly racist yeah. or had so much hesitation yeah. in condoning racism, uh, way more blacks would be uh, Republican. I agree. Because of the kind of cultural conservatism mm-hmm. that is seen um, in Republicans. Mm-hmm. Uh, but because that doesn't happen, yeah. uh, so many um, blacks are, are Democrat because there's so much uh, racism um, that is pervasive throughout the Republican Party. Um, and that that goes right to your point. That yeah. goes right to your point. Um, yeah, it, it's really, really complicated. What do you think? I know I know you're interviewing me, but I mean, I'm interested in hearing what you think. Um, I think things are multifaceted. And, you know, uh, you know, at this juncture in American history and, and politics, the current version of the American, of the Republican Party, uh, I don't think that the African American community can align with it. Um, it's too overtly uh, against that community. And I mean, by against, I mean like death. Yeah. Um, so, but I mean, at some point, you know, you know, it's however, the white, the overarching ideal of white supremacy is is over everything. So whether it's Democrat or Republican. Yeah. But uh, so you know, it could be beneficial if if. The African American community could move as a unit to say, okay, if the Democratic Party doesn't want to do this, then we're going to go support this, or we're going to stay with the Democratic candidate for this. However, you know, uh, my grandmother always said, you can't piss on me and tell me it's raining. <laughs> so, you know, that, that, you know, you have to deal with the, the current facts of the situation. Right, right, right. So, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's really complicated. So, me, so, although I know a lot of individuals uh, who are black, uh, are kind of culturally conservative. Yeah. You know, I'm culturally progressive. Yeah. Uh, and so, although we share the same uh, hue, uh, we're not always of the same view. Mm-hmm. Uh, All skin folk and can folk. <laughs> as long as we rhyme, you know, it's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So yeah, that's just. That, I think that's just how it is. And, and society is complicated, and, and people are complicated, and politics are complicated. Uh, uh, but the only thing that's not complicated is the the people with money have the power. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's always been the truth. <laughs> that is that is not complicated. Um, but yeah, other than that, yeah, it's 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 really really complicated. So to an- to answer your question, uh, uh, should all blacks uh, move as one solid block towards something? I mean, only if that direction is forward. Mm. I agree. <laughs> Only if that direction is forward. As they, as they say in Cuba, siempre pa'lante, siempre y nunca atrás. That's always forward, never backward, always up, you know. Yeah. That's, that's Miami slang. <laughs> yeah, so that, that, that's just how that is. Uh, and that's what, from your time in Florida that you spent? Oh, yeah. I've been speaking Spanish my whole life for years. Oh, all right, nice. Especially time down there. <laughs> nice, nice, yeah. nice, 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 nice. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that, that's just that's just really how it is. And also, we also have to realize that that, that race and racism is a, is a very very pecu- peculiar thing, right? Yeah. Because there are things that affect everyone, yeah. right? But race has people act against their own best interests, mm-hmm. right? 
and that has been something that has prevented progress in the South for a very, very long time. Mm, southern uh, strategy. Yeah, there, you know, there's been this continual election of people to powerful positions that have the vast majority of the public's interest not in, under consideration. It is not their priority. Mm -hmm. But they're able to get their votes based on pitting people against mm -hmm. each other. It's a very, very powerful tactic. Uh, so if you say, hey, don't like that person, and, and I give you a reason and say I represent what you represent, I can get you to vote against your own best interest. And there has been, throughout history, there has been really nothing that has gotten people to vote against their own best interests, mm -hmm. like racism. Mm -hmm. Hasn't really been anything else. Mm -hmm. And you can check out the history books and check out the history of politics. Mm -hmm. uh, racism has gotten people to vote against health care, yeah. environment, like you, you name it. They're just like, <laughs> if racism or the fear of the other person mm -hmm. is involved, people will always make irrational decisions. I'm and that continues you. to happen. You know, it's the linchpin of this country. And until, yeah. until it's, it's dealt with... Um, people are going to keep continuing to shoot themselves in the foot. Yeah, so, yeah. Oh, well, that's well. Let, one last question. So, yeah. What's on your horizon then? You know, I know you're going to run. Yes. You sure? You absolutely. We're in there. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm absolutely positive All that right. I'm going to uh, to to run again. The timing of that is is something else though. Okay. Uh, when is that actually going to happen? Um, and so that's going to be really important but like like we said earlier we don't really have much time mm -hmm. uh so making sure uh that we uh that i continue doing the work uh continue to show up on your talk show uh continue to show up at key events uh give key speeches representing ideas that i really really care about making sure we're going forward yeah um and writing and, and getting the, the views across is going to be paramount yeah going forward and uh Hopefully, on the horizon is a brighter future mm -hmm. uh, because we have, like I said, uh, this is a very strange time because it's like that book. It's like the best of times and the worst of times at the same time. So yeah. while we are in the midst, and for a lot of people, you know, it's not necessarily true, mm -hmm. uh, or in the midst of unprecedented uh, kind of embarrassment of riches, right? Yeah. Uh, like you and I, we were both college athletes, mm -hmm. I became a scientist, you became a lawyer, mm -hmm. we've been able to reach unprecedented levels for generations before us, mm -hmm. we're also on the brink of potential collapse at mm -hmm. the same time. Mm -hmm. So we have a very amazing time in which we can make amazing strides towards a, a, a better future, but the window is so very small, mm -hmm. and when that window closes, that means the window could possibly close on many people mm -hmm. uh, and, and, off, and society and civilization and humanity mm -hmm. uh, at, at large. Um, so, yeah, focus on climate change. It needs to be a priority. Mm -hmm. If I were able to communicate to anybody in power or anybody doing work or who cares, uh, every day you should be talking about climate change. Uh, shout out to William Barber, the son, William Barber the third, uh, who's doing amazing work in climate change. Um, I appreciate your work. I'm looking forward to working with you uh, and trying to address climate change. Um, yes, and anybody sir. else out there? Need Sarah Reverend Barber to come on over to Wahala Talk. Hey, you heard it. You heard it. Uh, I'll, I'll be posting this as soon as it becomes available. Uh, but yeah, man, it, it's Most great. Definitely. Well, I'm, I'm sure I have all the faith in you. I know you're gonna make the right play and, ex and engage in the correct execution. So, you know, all of my guys and women and ladies and gentlemen of Wahala Talk, you hear it here first, you know, Richard Watkins is going to throw his hand in the ring again, you know, and I'm sure he'll be victorious. So thanks again for tuning in to Wahala Talk. Uh, you know, it's been a wonderful ride. You know, we're closing out 2018, and we'll be sure to see you on the other side in 2019 and beyond. I want to thank Richard Watkins for taking the time. Thank you. Coming all the way down here to Raleigh <laughs> to, you know, chill and chop it up with the young Lex Jordan. Uh, you know, I'm so appreciative, and I just wanted to let you know that, and we definitely have to do a part two because we, yes. we were in really 
um, in depth on some situations and, and some topics, and I want to go further in depth later. So until next time, much blessings and peace. Happy New Year. Oh, 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 oh.